Well, good morning, church, and uh, I'm blessed once again to be with you this morning. Um, if you don't know who I am, my name is uh, Kevin. I'm one of the pastors here at Lake Almanor Community Church. Matt gives me the opportunity to, to speak every now and again, and today I get to speak on, uh, well, on, on, on the fall. And if you don't know what the fall was, that's when Adam and Eve uh, broke the one law that they had in the Garden of Eden and ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, let's get to that in just a second. But for so for the last couple of weeks, uh, Pastor Matt has has taken us back. He's taken us back to the like the very foundation, the very beginning of everything. Right when God created the heavens and the earth, when He spoke life into existence, when God had laid this perfect creation. And Matt talked about it last week, and he said it was very good. Each of those things was good, and, and when he was done, it was very good. We learned that God had created this kingdom, uh, not really just for himself, but for, for us, for man. You know, he, put, he placed Adam and Eve in the middle of this kingdom, the middle of this perfect creation. And God was with them. God walked with them. I mean, I, I think that what an incredible thing to think about that uh, that God walked in the garden with them. I mean, what 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 would that look like? What would that look like to you? Um, to just be just be present with the Creator all the time. It's an incredible, incredible thing. But sadly. Adam and Eve chose to reject God and to reject his rules. So today's message is called, Since the Fall, What Have We Lost? Because we've lost quite a bit. Not just the sin that came into our lives, but as we'll see, quite a lot of it. Let me pray for us before we get really into this. Father God, we are thankful uh, for you, Lord, and for your Son, and for redemption. Um, thankful for just the, the opportunity to share your word this morning, Lord. I pray that as as I speak, that the words that come out of my mouth are yours and not my own. And I pray for open ears and hearts and minds to receive this message this morning, Lord. And we love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so let's look at how we first got to this point where where we're losing, where we start losing things. Uh, Genesis chapter 3. If you have a Bible, open it up there first. And we'll look at a little bit of it right now. I want to read from Genesis chapter 3. And it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, Did, did God actually say, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the ser serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Right? For God knows that when you eat, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and she ate. And she also gave some of it to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So the first thing Satan did to get Eve was to question God's goodness. He did this by exa exaggerating God's boundaries. Did God really say that? Does God really say that? Does God really mean that? That you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So he's getting them to, to stop looking at the things that God has given them, right? God's given them all the trees except for the one. And he's going to point out the one. Why Why this one? Why not eat of this one? Why would he do that to you? 
And Eve, you know, quickly corrects Satan's error immediately. But notice now she's focused on this one tree and what she doesn't have instead of what she does have. Do we do that, church? Do you do that? Do you forget what you have when you covet maybe something that somebody else has? Oh, look at that brand new car. Or look at that money that they have. Or look at that. And then you forget that you have a house over your head. You have food in your belly. You, God has provided everything that you need. But there's always that, that something else. Next, Satan questioned God's motives. All right. He said in verse 4 and 5, You will not certainly die. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So Satan suggests that God lied to them out of jealousy, that they would become like him. And this is kind of ironic because Adam and Eve were like him. They were already like God. They carried the image of God within them. Matt, Matt talked about that last week, that God, that we are created in God's image. The fact is, they, they did gain some knowledge, but it wasn't what, what they wanted. You see, at that particular moment, before they took the fruit, all they knew was good. Can you imagine that? Living a life with when it's just purely good? There's no evil in the world. There's no evil ever. But by eating that fruit, they learned what was evil and that they knew that they were evil. You know, all of us have lost things from time to time. We might have lost uh, sons or daughters or husbands or wives, friendships or possessions. Some of us might have lost their health like myself jobs or security but could you ever imagine losing god and that's what happened on that day they lost that intimate relationship with god so number one on our outline is we have lost a perfect relationship with god a perfect relationship walking in the garden with him Going back to who we are, Matt talked about this last week as well, that we, ref we reflect something of God's glory, his splendor. We are a reflection of God. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him. Both male and female, he created him. All human beings, we all bear this authentic stamp, if you will, a stamp of authenticity that we are created by God. You know how you look for a fake, like maybe you have hummels or these different things and you look on the bottom and you and you look to see who, who the maker was, right? And and by knowing the maker, then you know, you know, how much that is worth. Well, we're worth everything because God's stamp is on you and it's on me. His stamp, his authenticity. We have the, the best designer label that you could have. We are unique in all that God made. You think, of, you think of back when Matt was talking about when God made all of these things, we were made uniquely different than all of those things. Evolution would teach us that we're not unique at all, that we're just a bit of matter, 17 trace elements that kind of somehow came together and, whoo, there you are, you know. While I was doing this, I, I read a funny story and I'm stealing it. Because um, I thought it was so good. It kind of really uh, hits home. It says, God, once approached, God was once approached by a scientist who said, Listen, God, we've decided we don't need you anymore. These days we can clone people, transplant organs, do all sorts of things that used to be considered miraculous. And God replied, You don't need me, huh? Well, how about we put that theory to the test? Why don't we have a competition to see who can make a human being, say, a male human being? The scientist agrees. So then God declares they should do it like he did it in the good old days when he created Adam. Fine, said the scientist, as he bends down to scoop up a handful of dirt. And God said, whoa, shaking his head in disapproval. 
Not so fast. You get your own dirt. But seriously, our self-worth is not found in what we're made of. It's not found in the genes that we're made of, the, the, any, any of that that we're made of, the dust that we're made from. Our self-worth comes from who made us? God, who made each and every one of us, you and me, man and woman, in his own image. That seal, that stamp of authenticity. God didn't just create us out of the dirt. God went on to do a divine act with that dirt. Genesis 2, 7 says, Then God, then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. He breathed the breath of life into our nostrils. God reveals here that we are special and, and we have such a unique relationship with him. God never did this act with any of the other creatures or things on the earth. God never did this except for to us. And Adam and Eve knew God, but like all relationships, sometimes there's, most of the times there's ground rules, right? Genesis 2, 16 through 17 says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden. So first off, let me tell you, you can eat of all, everything that is here. All, look at all of this vast, these vast trees and things, plants. You can eat of all of that, but the tree of knowledge of good and evil shall not eat. You shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Not like, you know, he, he said, hey, look, at look, you have all of this. Just, just save this one tree. And obviously we know, uh, we know the story that they, they, dis they disobeyed. They blew it. They blew it all away for what? A piece of fruit? And for ultimately just knowing evil? Because they knew all the good. I know it's awful sometimes when you hear stories of, of people who have destroyed their marriages for what? A one night stand, for a glass of whiskey, for a sniff of cocaine, some, for some pornography. But this isn't any human relationship that Adam and Eve blew away, but a relationship with God, a divine relationship with God. The created looked more appealing than the creator at that particular time. Adam and Eve's choice had great repercussions. And as a result, that one act of disobedience, a perfect relationship was lost. A division was created in the relationship of God and all human relationships after it. Romans 5.19 says, by the, one man's, by the one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. And usually what does disobedience lead to? It leads to a cover-up. In verse 8, it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So we see once again, here's God walking, walking in the garden and calling out, Hey, Adam, hey, where are you guys at? We see God's desire to have that relationship with Adam and Eve. And the Bible reveals God walking in the garden, the cool of day. It goes on to tell that they heard the sound of God. So it must have been a familiar sound of his presence. I mean, I don't know exactly what that sounds like, but obviously they did. They knew he was walking in the garden. They knew he was coming. And then they hid. Instead of meeting God, they hide amongst the trees. And as a result of their disobedience against God's ground rules came awareness of their nakedness and their rebellion. Here we have two people trying to hide from the all-seeing and all-knowing God. Pretty kind of funny, right? How could, be, how could they be so silly to believe that they could hide? But the truth be known, we do the same thing, don't we, church? I do it. 
I would imagine you do it too. We hide our sins from one another. Uh, I remember one day uh, I was driving uh, my parents' golf cart when I was a teenager. And I was driving it around and I came home and I hit the garage door open there. And it was one of those old garage doors that was just a single pane, right? And it lifted up. And as I was driving in, I must have hit the button again and it came back down. And it went smack dab into the middle of the roof of the golf cart and psh, broke into all these pieces. So what did I do? Did I go and I tell my parents, you know, hey, look, I, uh, I wrecked the golf cart and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry and, you know, do whatever you want. No, I got those pieces. I got some super glue and I thought I was going to fix it and hope that nobody saw it. How many of us do that? How many, how many of you have done something like that? Knocked over something nice of your parents and then tried to glue it back together. Tried to hide it from their eyes. And we try to hide things from God's eyes who sees all. Not one of us can hide from God. We have all failed. We have all failed him in one way or the other. Stolen, sworn, lied, bullied, ridiculed, gossiped. You name it, we've done it. Even as adults, we still do the same. We try to cover up our stains from friends and family, from one another. And it might be possible to live a lie, but not before than all-seeing and all-knowing God. That's absolute foolishness. But here, Adam and Eve thought that they were hiding. Their eyes were opened, and Adam and Eve felt guilty over what they had done. That was what the knowledge that they received. Now the knowledge of guilt of, of when they did wrong. They had never done wrong before. They realized that they had gone strictly against God's command. And God called out. And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. That's Adam replying to God. Why should they be afraid? Well, their conscience had kicked in. And they knew that they had done wrong. They had done bad, good and evil. That conscience of ours is a warning signal from God placed inside of us when we do wrong. The worst thing we can do is ignore our conscience when it speaks to us and believe what we have done is perfectly acceptable, right? We just ate of the fruit. It was good. Second thing we've lost is a perfect world. God had prepared this beautiful creation for us. This garden of Eden. All of the world, and then there was set apart even just this incredible place, the garden of Eden. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And as he looked around the world today, we see, we see wonderful things. We live in a wonderful place, and we see incredible stuff, but... Compared to what Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden, nothing compares to that. It was absolutely heaven on earth. The first of creation, it was perfect. There was no decay. There was provisions of food with the animals, and there was abundance of everything. It says in Genesis 2.8, And the Lord planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made a spring, made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the middle of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as well. So God, God created this perfect world and placed man in the middle of it to take care of it. The world was a most spectacular place. Adam and Eve lived in this perfect world. And when, within this garden, they had that personal relationship with God. Here they could have forever lived with God. This place, once again, was literally heaven on earth. But when they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, not only did their relationship with God change, but the earth changed too. And as a result of sin, the world that we live in right now is dying and it's decaying. In Genesis 3.17, God cursed the earth. He says, and to Adam, he said, 
Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. Romans 8.20 22 says, For creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Sadly, we see that this world that we live in is slowly decaying, we see increases in, in earthquakes, droughts and floods and famines, hurricanes and tsunamis. This is a result. These natural disasters are a result of the fall, that we have lost this perfect world. Third thing that we have lost is eternal life with God. Prior to the fall, Adam and Eve had eternal life. They, they would have spent the life there with God, life which would have lasted forever. No de disease, no death. But as a result of their de act of disobedience, this one thing, God told Adam, you shall die. If you eat of the fruit of the tree, good and evil. And they did exactly that. And as a consequence, sin came into the world. And Romans tells us, for the wages of sin is death, eternal dying, continual dying. Adam and Eve were banished from the garden. And as a result of their sin, each and every person in this entire world is born into it. We're born into a broken relationship with God. You see, you see humanity has been banished by God from his immediate presence as a result of disobedience. And if you remain in a state of rejecting Christ, you too will also be banished from heaven itself. Banished to horror. The devil contradicts God and his word at every, every means that he has. He did it here with the serpent, and he did it with Jesus, remember, during the temptations. Here the devil possessed a serpent who brought a lie into the world. And the world, ever since, is doing the same thing. We too today have choices just like Adam and Eve. We can choose to follow the creator, or we can choose to follow the created. I'm sure all of you are aware of death, but are you ready to embrace it? Are you ready? Do you think that if God took you today, or if death took you today, that God would take you today? That you would be with him in heaven? Death is, death is a serious thing. It's a question of our future of eternity. One of the things I like to tell the kids, I like to say that every one of us is going to live forever. It just depends on what the zip code is. There was a British mathematician, philosopher, Bertrand Russell, and he said that death is a night of nothingness. Church of the Bible says that we are destined to die and then the judgment. Hebrews 9 27 says, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting him. Who are you believing? The philosopher or God's word? Revelations 20, 14 puts it this way. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. The deception is that it's after death 
There's nothing, right? That's one of the things the world will tell you. You just die and that's it. You know, I mean, you, you were here for however long you were here. Live it, love it, do whatever you want, and then you're gone. That's the end of it. But that's not the truth. That's not the truth at all. You must understand that's the teaching of the devil himself. In scripture, the devil is a liar and the father of all lies. Let me tell you a story that Jesus told in Luke 16, 19 through 31. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple, fine linen, who, was, who feasted sumptuously every day. And his gate was, was laid, and at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in the cool water. And my, in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in his like manner bad things. But now he is comfortable here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who pass from here to you may not be able to and none may cross from here, from there to us. Then I beg you, Father, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that they may warn that he may warn them, lest they come into the place of torment. But Abraham said, "They have Moses, Moses, and the prophets. Let them hear them." And he said, "No, Father Abraham. But if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent." And he said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. So here we have two people, two people that died. And then both of them lived after death. Yet one received eternal life and the other received eternal death. And there was no way out. Where are you at? in your belief for Christ. Where are you, where is your zip code gonna be? Let's look back, let's let's look at what we have lost. A little recap, so we have lost a relationship with God, first and foremost. We have lost that perfect world, that Eden. We have lost eternal life. So today I've, I've kind of probably given you a lot of bad stuff. But here in the opening of Genesis, there is a promise of victory. It says the seed of the woman will bruise the serpent's head. So Genesis 3, 5, 15 says, I will put immunity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head. And you shall bruise his heel. God lays down a promise right here in Genesis that victory will be his and that God's kingdom will be restored and our late relationship with God will be restored. That our world would be made into a new creation and that our lives will be spent with God in a perfect relationship forever. So all of that bad, all of those things we lost, God promises to give it all back to us. Isaiah 65, 17 says, for, for, before, for behold, I created new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. There will be a new heaven, a new earth, and we won't even remember this place and the, and, and the, and the death and the decay and the, the suffering anymore. Revelations 21 puts it this way. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. So this is all going to go away. All of these, these struggles, these hurts, this disease. My kidneys will be 
uh, healed. All because of Jesus, the second Adam. He will be the victor. He will tread down Satan forever and conquer sin. If we read this Bible, if we read our Bible, we will see throughout the Bible the theme of the victorious Christ prospering over evil to the ultimate conquest upon the cross at Calvary when he gave his life so that sin in our lives would be no more, that they would be washed away. So the question today, church, is are you a winner or are you a loser? And that depends on if you're in Adam or you're in Jesus. The choice is yours. Do we want to live in this world that we're in now? Do we want the things of this world or do we want those things that we cannot see those things that God offers us in heaven with him forever I'm glad that you guys were able to uh, spend some time with me today uh, hopefully um, I didn't uh, you know uh, wasn't too many bad things because ultimately the answer is Jesus Jesus came and to abolish all of that sin to make up for what Adam had done for all that brokenness that we live in today um, if you are in Christ, um, the day there, there is a new day coming, and uh, and I'm thankful for that. If you're not, um, and you're you're thinking about it, hey, we would love to talk to you about that. If you 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 think you might want to make a decision and follow Christ today, uh, we would like to hear from you. Give us a call here at church. If there's anything you need, give us a call here at church. We love you. and We miss having you here uh, on on Sundays, but uh, but we're. We, we love the fact that we're able to uh, share a message with you uh, through the internet. So have a great week and we'll see you next time.